Coming up on Home Diagnosis. Imagine if cars were built like houses. Building's not an easy business. This whole process has given us such empathy for contractors. We should all be building better. Amazing. These affordable units tend to be built better than most market rate buildings. Why are you building such good houses if it's supposed to be affordable? Shouldn't you do the worst house you can possibly legally build? Would you want to go back to building the old way? Oh no, no, this is much easier. Home Diagnosis is made possible by support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, by Fantech, Breathe Easy, by Brown Newtone, Come Home to Fresh Air, by April Air, Everyone Deserves Healthy Air, by Air Cycler, Retrotech, and Santa Fe Dehumidifiers, by generous support from these underwriters and by viewers like you. Whether or not you've been following home diagnosis for the past two seasons, you might have experienced the distrust that exists between homeowners and building contractors, a distrust that goes both ways. So as we expose the root causes of many of the home health, comfort, durability, and efficiency problems that are so common today, it's important to step back and look at the culture of the home improvement and construction industry that might explain how we got here. Let's look into the daily work of being a contractor, the ups and downs that have made it challenging for builders and tradespeople to think of the home as a system, to consider the invisible dynamics of home performance, much less help you control them. They say home is where the heart is. And we certainly put our heart into building our first house, so how hard could it be to build another one? I'm Grace. And I'm Corbett. In our tiny lab, we helped homeowners gain control of their homes through scientific testing. Now, as we build our forever home, we're testing ourselves. Even though we know a few things about the invisible dynamics of homes, we're teaming up with scientists and building experts to design and build a perfectly tuned home for our family. The physics, chemistry, and microbiology of a home might seem mysterious, but it doesn't need to be. While this is a personal story, full of twists and turns, it's also the story of the science of homes. Join us to unlock the mysterious science of your home, too. Imagine if cars were built and bought like houses. If cars were built like houses, each one would be built outdoors, exposed, in the middle of a muddy field. If cars were built like houses, each car would be slightly different than all others and would be built under different laws, depending on where in the country the muddy field was located. Each part of the car would be put together and installed by a different company with different workers guided by different supervisors on different semi-dependable schedules if cars were built like houses. Sometimes, in the rush to finish the car, the battery or steering wheel wouldn't arrive in time, so we'd just put it on the punch list and get to it later. If cars were bought like houses, no part of the car would be tested by anyone except the buyer, who just makes sure the paint looks nice and the seats feel good. If cars were bought like houses, car shoppers would never drive the car before they bought it and no one would ask about the mileage per gallon since no manufacturer ever bothered to measure it. Also, I forgot to mention that these cars would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, the biggest thing you'll ever buy. If you hate this story, then next time you shop for a home, look for home performance testing and quality control checklists. Proof is possible. Ask for it. Now having designed this house and then brought structural engineering in and the architect and also keeping performance goals in mind, this whole process has given us such empathy for contractors. On this project, we are the GC, but I can just imagine on another project and dealing with another set of homeowners. Getting handed a set of plans like this that I did not design would maybe raise a bunch of questions. Are you sure you want this? Are you sure you want that? And there's just not a lot of communication in the building industry. Also, subcontractors are very busy in a boom period and very desperate for work in a bust period. So you either have people who don't need to return your call because they've got plenty of work, or they're taking calls while they're doing your work so that they can fill the next week of their schedule. And both of those ways, it's not a very healthy industry to work in. 
It's a lot of detail and there's a lot of feast and famine. So I think we as homeowners need to bring a lot of patience. So the first thing to understand when you're talking about home building, contracting, renovation, home improvement is it's exhausting work and it's dangerous. So be patient with them. Also, the things that we're dealing with on a build like this, or in your build, because it's the same stuff, is coming from a factory. And it's supposed to be technically straight and square and level and plumb. Uh, the pieces of wood, for example, two by four, which is called dimensional lumber. And this is an eye joist, uh, which is an engineered product made in a factory to be perfect. Both of them are gonna be a little warped, a little twisted, uh, might not be the exact same depth and thickness all the time. And that is something that the people that work on your house are having to deal with all the time. They're chiseling out and they're having to fix things that kind of didn't show up perfect. So creative thinking is very important. Now there are three big things that any contractor is gonna be worried about. Number one is weather. If they're working inside, then it doesn't really matter. But anybody who's working outside, every time it rains, every single job they have gets put on hold. No one makes any money in the construction industry when it rains. It's incredible. Second thing is change orders. You and I both know that we're gonna walk in here maybe and say, ooh, wouldn't it be cooler if this was moved over there or we could put the refrigerator because we didn't take enough time to think about it. Again, really take your time planning a house an addition, a renovation, because once you're in the middle of it, it's a lot harder to change these things. General rule of thumb is, it costs one unit, one dollar, let's say, to plan something into your project. It takes 10 times as much to change it when we're at this stage that you see around us. And it costs 100 times as much after the house is finished to be able to cut into the wall or the ceiling and really start changing the way that the structure is going. So we don't want to be doing a lot of change orders. That being said, come visit your site because being here and seeing the stuff where it's only 10 times as expensive as it was in the design phase to change things around, they're gonna be much more relaxed. Their nightmare is that you walk in when they're putting up drywall and you say, ooh, really? The last thing they're afraid of is lawsuits. It is possible over the course of the year or more that it might take to build your house or do an addition if you're doing one that's really fancy, that you might turn on them. And whether or not you're the kind of person who's gonna do that, they're afraid that you might be. So make sure that you try and spell everything out up front, have a good relationship, use this, and try and see things from the builder's perspective. I think the main obstacle that keeps contractors from kind of evolving or changing their business from kind of standard construction to a, a higher level of performance is really just getting stuck in the rut of, of, of the daily grind of just making sure they, they feed their families to be, to be totally honest. If you've been building standard houses and you haven't had problems with those houses, uh, problems like wet basements or mold claim or some some other bigger type of problem. If you haven't had those problems, you're building you know single story uh, ranch houses with two foot or three foot overhangs. You know those houses are are pretty bulletproof. <laughs> you know you can even build them uh, like we do in Texas with 70s construction methods, and you're not going to have a big issue. Your energy bills may be high. You may be uncomfortable. You may not have great indoor air quality. You may have bugs coming in your house. But none of those issues are something you're going to, you know, sue your builder over. Building's not an easy business. I mean, contracting, you're not, you're not entering this business as a get rich quick scheme. Clients have high expectations. And also, generally speaking, money is a hard thing to come by. You know, for the most part, most builders out there are making 2 to 3% at the, uh, at the bottom line when it's all said and done. So you think about a, you know, million dollar house. But if you're making two or three percent on that at the end, that's a lot of liability. That's a lot of uh, moving parts and pieces to make you know fifty thousand dollars a year. And there's a lot of builders out there that are that are making that fifty thousand dollars a year in their business. While the title of our show is Home Diagnosis, the word home comes in many different forms. And not everybody lives in a house. Lots of us live in multifamily buildings. This new building is actually a mix of affordable and market rate housing. And just like the home is a system, the building becomes a system. So tuning the performance of a multifamily building is much more interesting. Let's talk to the people who are responsible for the tuning of this project's performance. Carl and Abe. Hey. All right. Good, man. Good to see you. Thank you guys very much for being us out here. Good to see you. Good seeing you. 
Yeah, this is a beautiful project. Yeah. Yes. Congratulations on bringing another one home. <laughs> uh, Almost, we're close. Yeah, right, right. Home well, stretch. And I'm glad that we get to see it like this before the furniture goes in, because I think that people, it's important for them to understand that if they want quality control over performance, they need people like you to come in and just look at stuff, right? So you're here inspecting and testing on multifamily buildings all over the place, right? right. So what are you seeing across state lines just as a kind of trend that needs to be kind of steered in the right direction in multifamily buildings? Well, uh, what a lot of what we do is we're inspecting the quality of installation. Insulation work, air sealing, HVAC systems, wa water management. And what's interesting is that most of what we're doing is enforcing codes and manufacturers recommended instructions. So really what we're doing is we're, we're enforcing a base level of quality. And when you, when you design a building well, you know, sort of consciously, and follow all those things and do them correctly, you basically have a green building. It doesn't take that much work. Right. The challenge is, is that the, in, the trades tend to not do a good job consistently with those things. So we're constantly pushing them to do those things correctly. Mm -hmm. I think part of the issue in the projects that we've worked in is that people just don't talk to each other. Like these people might all work on the same buildings, but they literally never have a meeting where they're like, hey, can you not do that because it screws up my plumbing or whatever it is. Do you find the same thing? We do. And I would say integrative design, bringing all those trades and all the designers to the table together is one, a struggle, but it has a huge payoff. It really helps the projects turn out better. You get donuts or pizza. Yeah, it's a pizza party. And you invite them to <laughs> Bribes the Bribes always help. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of the carrot, you know, to go with the stick. Absolutely. Right. One of the challenges is that in construction is such a, it's, it's such a challenging business from a financial standpoint. Everybody's, everybody's trying to do the low bid. Like, do we want low bids on our cars and our doctors mm -hmm. and things? Um, so you're struggling. You're, you're, they're not paying people as much as they should be paid to do stuff work well. And then you're trying to coax better quality work out of them. Mm -hmm. So in multifamily buildings, because you're dealing with not just the pressure of the one home, but of all of them stacked next to each other, the ventilation and the fresh air flows, especially when you got things like elevators in the building, become a, a big conversation. So how do you guys put your head around the idea of ventilation with outdoor air in a multifamily setting? Yeah, one of the big concerns in multifamily is you never want to smell what your neighbor is doing. Right. right? So you want a tight unit or a compartmentalized unit. And then you want to make sure that you're ventilating within that unit. So there's ventilation in the bathroom, exhausting any moisture, any odors, ventilation in the kitchen, exhausting to the outdoors. They're trying to make these units as tight as possible, but also providing adequate ventilation. These affordable units tend to be built better than most market rate buildings, which, which we find really interesting. That is interesting, isn't it? I've actually been to some states where the affordable housing people say that their subcontractors keep giving them kickback. This, you're the only people who make me do this stuff, which means that in the entire state, yeah. this is the superior, scientifically superior housing stock. It, it absolutely is. We build really, really good houses. And people say, yes, but this is affordable housing. Why are you building such good houses if it's supposed to be affordable? Shouldn't you do the worst house you can possibly legally build? Which is, of course, a code home. We say, well, no. I mean, if anybody needs a better house, it's a low-income homeowner, right? Because they can't afford to come in later on and, and fix all the things that we screwed up when we designed and built the house. So yeah, they're, they're super high performance. And that's the beautiful thing about being part of a nonprofit is that, you know, nobody's telling you, you can't do this stuff. And so we're proving that we absolutely can. A lot of people think that low income housing is some kind of a giveaway for people. And if you tell somebody that you can spend more money upfront to build a better performing home and actually save a low income family money, they're going to say, you're washed up. That can't happen. You can't possibly spend more to build a home and show a positive cash flow to a low income family. Here's why. All they think of is the upfront per square foot cost, right? I mean, that's what that's 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 somehow that's the metric that we use for our housing. How much does it cost per square foot? I get that question all the time. You know, when you bought your car, did you ask how much it cost per pound? No, that's a terrible metric. Buying and selling houses by the square foot, also a pretty terrible metric. Unfortunately, that's the only language though that the real estate market tends to, to delve into. How much does houses in that neighborhood cost per square foot on a resale? But when you build a new house, there's so much more that goes into it than just cost per square foot. Educating people and understanding the kind of correlation between a well-built house and what it takes to build that well-built house is something that I've dealt with for years. 
Now every wall, floor, and ceiling potentially in your house is a cavity. It's not actually a flat thing, right? So you might have some mystery rooms in your home. This is a mystery room that is high performance. This is the central service chase that we planned for uh, a couple episodes ago. And you can see what it looks like now. It's basically a tunnel that runs through the center of our building so that we can run all the stuff that runs inside of your walls and floors and ceilings, electric, plumbing, ducts through a very accessible, easy place to get to where there's lots of room to work with. The nightmare generally on the HVAC side is when the duct installer shows up and he looks around and says, well, where am I supposed to put these ducts that I so carefully designed in a computer? Now that I'm looking at this, you didn't leave me into that room. Well, we had to add extra wood because of blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of what we're dealing with. So when you design a central service chase into a house, you're taking away that variable and you're allowing the people who have to come and put all the stuff that's gonna work inside your house where it belongs. Remember all of the dirt issues that we had with our foundation in the last episode. It's no wonder now that we're $25,000 over budget and three months behind schedule that people don't wanna focus on the invisible stuff that you might not be able to sense it, you might not care. You might not be willing to pay more for it. So of course, it's gonna be difficult to get builders and home improvement contractors to pay attention to and want to deliver these invisible elements because it's so hard to just get a house out of the ground. On every build site, a builder who's honest will tell you that things are going wrong every single day. The question is whether we find those mistakes and then fix them or whether we hide them behind drywall. Hey. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Good to see Good you. Thank you, you very yeah. much for having Thank us. Thank you for coming. So you are the project manager, superintendent, boss of this entire project. Yes. Thank okay. you. And you've been a builder for a long time. Yep. This is one of the first performance tuned buildings that you've been, where you had to go through inspections and testing and all that stuff, right? Correct. Correct. What's your experience been as a builder? Well, actually the processes we've got and the improvement in materials has really made it very friendly for the installers. Now we do meet and we, we show them the performance criteria, how we want it installed and how it should be on an end product. So, and we stay with them daily. And after a while, after they get it done, two or three installations, you're getting in a rhythm and all of a sudden it, it just continues on in a very consistent pattern yeah. throughout. When you first heard that this project was gonna be high performance, you just never know. Every time you start hearing some of these things, oh no, what do I got to do now? But no, it's been good. It's been interesting. Everything uh, has gone quite well and uh, everybody seems to chip in. No real pushback. It's been a happy surprise. Yeah, the, the performance on the interior of the, um, the units itself is much more comfortable. Would you want to go back to building the old way? Oh no, no, this is much easier. Uh, it's just, you're taking a number of steps out. It's a much more thorough process and a much better performing operation. What's this test called? Blow order test. That's right. Yes, four-year-old knows how to run a blow order test. Should you be afraid of this test? No. Are you afraid of this test? No. No. She's not afraid. Why are grown men afraid of this test? My relationship to testing is an interesting one because, uh, you know, when I first got into high performance construction almost 20 years ago now, I remember my very first blower door test uh, and I thought I was building a good house at the time. And I got this piece of paper back saying, wait a minute, this is anywhere near what I thought I was going to be. What if, what do you mean? I have a hole in my building this size. Like, is that possible? I mean, I was there. It looked like a pretty good house to me. So then I started delving into, well, how do we build a tighter house? How, what, what, maybe we should use spray foam. Maybe we should do this or that. And I remember getting, again, my test results back, spe specifically blower doors and being like, what? I thought this was going to be a lot lower. Dang it. So then the next house I build, I do a couple things differently. Oh, that's got, it's got to be the problem. That's totally it. We're going to crush this one. You get it back. What? Dang it. I thought that was going to be better. And honestly, it's taken me a long time to get below one ACH 50 on my blower door. I mean, like 15 years worth, frankly. And these days now, you're seeing builders across the country posting some of their scores on social media. It's a whole different world out there. But testing is key to that. If you don't test, if you don't measure, you have no idea what you built. Home diagnosis isn't aiming for homes to be built higher performance. That's actually happening now, whether we like it or not. 
the energy codes of today are making it state law across the U.S. that new homes be built more airtight and tested to prove it. They must have more insulation than ever before, and the HVAC equipment must be tailored to fit the home with a computerized load calculation. So what happens when energy efficient targets are enforced? Less energy is wasted, which is good, but energy efficiency and home performance are not the same thing. New homes are in danger of developing moisture and indoor pollution problems if builders just aim to conserve energy by meeting code. We're also building with new materials like foams, plastics, and adhesives, and these have much different impacts on moisture flow and chemical emissions than older homes experienced. All this to say, in the 21st century, it is virtually impossible to build like they did in the old days. So we need to wise up to the new dynamics of home performance. That is the goal of home diagnosis. Every year in Kalamazoo, Michigan, we would let's build a house in 24 hours. We would start with a foundation because you're not going to watch concrete cure while you're, you know, getting ready to go. We would have the foundation poured and a little, you know, rough landscaping. And we'd start at seven o'clock in the morning and 350 people roughly would, would be a part of this. And they had it, they had it down to the minute. I mean, you know, this, you know, you talk about a build schedule and you're looking at, you know, it could be months and months, it could be years sometimes. And everybody says, oh, I would never want a house that was built in 24 hours. You know, it's like, there's got to be all kinds of flaws and shortcuts and everything else. And I was working with that affiliate for, well, as a volunteer for 20 years and then as an employee for about five. And we never had more problems with those houses than we've had with any other houses. Remember, a lot of our houses are, you know, built by volunteers. You might have heard the myth that homes need to breathe, which implies that you don't want to build too airtight. This is completely wrong if you want to control home performance. Build tight and then ventilate right. Here's the mistake we make if we depend on accidental air leakage through the cracks in a home. First, you can't control where the air your family breathes comes from or where it goes. You might be breathing polluted air from a crawl space, or you might be pushing warm, moist air into a cold building cavity where it'll condense and grow mold. Second, a house that breathes through the cracks depends entirely on the weather outside to drive circulation. When it's very hot, cold, or windy out, you'll get way more accidental ventilation than you need, which makes it overly dry or humid inside. And when the weather is mild outside every spring and fall, that's when it gets really interesting. Imagine you have a week of lukewarm weather with cloudy skies. If the temperature outside and inside is the same, then you'd get virtually no accidental ventilation at all. The whole goal of the indoors is to give us a refuge from the weather. So why would you want to depend on it for your accidental ventilation? Plus, now more than ever, we know that when a builder hands over the keys and a family moves in, they need systems in place to control the indoor chemistry. Every time that family cooks or uses cleaning products, they can make the indoor air exponentially more polluted than outdoors. So aim for as much air tightness as you can get at home, and then get the right amount of fresh air from the right place with your ventilation system. Sometimes I wonder why I bother weeding. And I think it's because I don't trust weeds. I think weeds are out to get my tomato plants. And often the same is true in construction. There's a big lack of trust. Homeowners are fearful that contractors are out there to get them and contractors are afraid their customers might turn on them. But construction and improvement projects are susceptible to all kinds of things that can cause a project to take longer and go over budget. While touring the country, we hit a few building industry conferences where the attendees were, you guessed it, mostly men. <laughs> and we passed around our baby and these gruff construction dudes quickly became a sweet bunch of uncles and grandpas ready to make her laugh. Babies can melt any heart. And it's also important to remember that the houses we build are going to hold our most precious cargo. We have a great responsibility to build well, and it's going to take trust from both sides to do it right. So contractors, please smile so you don't seem so scary. And homeowners, give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, most of their days are hard ones. We just continue to do things the same way over and over and over. And part of the problem is that it's, it's hard to educate people, right? For the most part, even clients that are well-educated or maybe have even built a couple of houses before, 
they still ask the wrong questions often or focus on the wrong things. Uh, and oftentimes it's strictly a bottom line thing. We're on the rubber meets the road and it's time to actually talk about the budget and what um, their project is going for. Oftentimes what they're saying and what they're doing don't seem to mesh. Uh, and, and there's way more jokes you know, at the party when people are talking about their terrible building experience than the opposite where people go, oh, my builder was amazing. No, my builder was unbelievable. You should hear about him. He's so fantastic. He did all my punch lists perfectly and I don't have any problems with my house. Wouldn't it be awesome if that's the world we lived in, right? A career as a plumber, an electrician, that's a fantastic career. I'm so proud of your son for, for going to electrical trade school. Now he's a master electrician. Can you believe that? That's so fantastic. That's what we need. And that's what it's like in a lot of countries. You know, and uh, when I traveled through Switzerland and Germany, the plumber would show up to the job in a full uniform. She's there to make it happen. They're a plumber. I mean, that's the way it should be in America. Whereas we're like, oh, it's the, you know, my son couldn't do anything. He's a dummy. So now he's a builder, whatever. We're doing things that are going to be around for a long, long time. How long is that attorney's case that he worked on going to be talked about? Maybe a year? Whereas the things that we build, people are going to live in for generations. Now that's a big deal. Yes, today's new and old homes often have performance problems that can cause comfort, moisture, and health issues. It can be easy and short-term satisfying to point fingers and assign blame, but the fact is we all got here together and we need to get out of it together. You can help change the culture of the home improvement and construction industry by asking the right questions about home performance and using the right language to describe it. To learn more about it, visit homediagnosis.tv. I'm gonna give you one more look at all of this because there's only one wall left. So we're Ready? gonna start nailing this up. Okay, here they go. Ready, guys? All right, so that, by the way, is our bedroom. Hey, Saturday night. And Corbett, that over there is the recording studio. Home Diagnosis is made possible by support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, by Fantech, Breathe Easy, by Brown Newtone, Come Home to Fresh Air, by April Air, Everyone Deserves Healthy Air, by Air Cycler, Retrotech, and Santa Fe Dehumidifiers, by generous support from these underwriters, and by viewers like you.